Hello, it's wonderful to welcome everyone to the second in our series on crisis management for African business leaders. I'm Teresa Clark and I'm privileged to serve as the chairman and CEO of Africa.com. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this webinar series. Today is the second session, as I've mentioned, and we're going to be focused on liquidity, what to do when revenues and funding sources dry up. One bit of feedback that we had from last week, our first session, was that people wanted to know a little bit more about who Africa.com is and what we do. Many of you know us as a media company that produces the Africa.com top 10 business news that we curate and publish on a weekly basis. We deliver in summary format the most important business stories of the week. It's free and it will be sent to all of the registrants of this webinar. Others of you are new to our company and we welcome you. We are grateful to our friends on the faculty at Harvard Business School, Dr. Linda Hill, Hakeem Bella Osagi, and Dr. Andy Zalecki, who all agreed early on to work with us on the development of this program. During this pandemic, Harvard Business School has made all of its content on the coronavirus available for free. This is a treasure trove of newly created content over the last month available for business leaders worldwide, including articles from the Harvard Business Review, the Harvard Business Tools Working Knowledge Publication, various webinars, podcasts, and pieces published in the last month on the healthcare industry, etc. It is all available at hbs.edu slash coronavirus. Again, you can go straight to hbs.edu slash coronavirus to access a number of additional resources as you consider how to, uh, how to proceed as a manager during this time. We at Africa.com committed ourselves to undertaking this series without any funding as we thought that this would be part of our contribution to the continent. Nonetheless, a handful of companies whose values are synonymous with African leadership came forth and offered sponsorship of this series. And so I would like to thank our silver sponsors, General Electric Africa, particularly Patricia Obuzua, FSDH Merchant Bank, particularly Tosa Agbamo, and the Trade and Development Bank, and especially our speaker today, Agmasu Tedese. I would especially like to thank our friends at Standard Bank for stepping up to be presenting sponsor of this crisis management series. Standard Bank has also made its chief executive, Sim Shabalala, one of the most sought after business speakers on the continent, available to you today. I'd like to thank Sim, Kalisa Vapi, Kate Johns, Katleho Maleka, and Laura Noyce. We are very grateful for your support. Before we jump into the business discussion, we would like to invite Dr. Michelle Yao back again this week to give us an update on COVID-19 from a Pan-African perspective. We are fortunate to have Dr. Yao, who is with the World Health Organization and is leading the emergency response to COVID-19 for WHO in Africa. He is taking time from the front lines of fighting the pandemic on the ground to speak with all of us and to give us a first-hand account and inside view with a pan-African lens on COVID-19 today. We think that it's helpful as we start this conversation about the business aspects of COVID-19 for us to all be on the same page with respect to the facts on where the, the pandemic is. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Yao. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm pleased to join uh, this uh, initiative. Um, just to start, I would say that the situation is evolving uh, a bit uh, uh, fast in Africa, even if um, compared to the uh, remaining part of the world, we have uh, uh, fewer number compared to Europe and uh, other uh, continent. Uh, we have uh, now passed the, since uh, uh, last week, uh, the um, average number of, of uh, 600 uh, cases per, per, per day, uh, and this uh, may uh, increase uh, uh, further. Um, in total, uh, um, if uh, we can move to the next slide. So uh, the number that you see is for 47 countries uh, in uh, uh, the sub-Saharan African and uh, plus Algeria is uh, where, where countries that we are covering. Uh, but in total, for the all continent, is about 24,000, uh, more than 24,000 cases, and uh, uh, a bit more than 1,100 uh, deaths. Uh, this brings uh, to 4.9, uh, what we call the case fatality rate, uh, 
that is uh, the proportion of people dying out of a uh, sick uh, uh, person. Um, so um, the next uh, uh, slide is showing uh, the map. And, and in this map, um, except the uh, northern countries that belong to the Mediterranean office, you can see in a darker color, uh, Algeria uh, on the top and then South Africa on the south. These are the, uh, in our region, the most affected uh, countries and then uh, um, followed by uh, countries in West Africa and uh, also a few countries in Central Africa, including uh, DRC uh, uh, Cameroon. Um, uh, the uh, next slide is showing the summary that I, I mentioned uh, earlier, combining uh, countries from our two regional uh, offices. So these numbers uh, were shown, and we can see that uh, in Eastern Mediterranean office, uh, we have a higher uh, case fatality rate. This is related to uh, mainly uh, Egypt with 7% uh, uh, of uh, case fatality rate, and uh, also Sudan that is close to uh, 9%. And in uh, the sub-Saharan, um, uh, we have uh, uh, Algeria that is close uh, also to uh, 12%. Uh, percent. Um, in uh, uh, the way the outbreak is progressing, unfortunately, uh, it gave chance to some, the, it's still giving chance to some of the countries to control. This is the next slide. And uh, we have uh, six countries where we have community transmission. It's mean that the, the cases uh, uh, move from the imported uh, case uh, to uh, then the community, and then you have the sustained community uh, uh, transmission. And so in the sub-Saharan African countries, uh, plus Algeria, we have six uh, plus uh, four in the Eastern Mediterranean office. So this brings to 10 countries that have uh, a community sustained transmission in our continent. And then we have uh, about 22 countries uh, with uh, clusters. It's a, a group of cases that are still uh, linked. Uh, so it gives uh, further opportunity for control. And then we have uh, uh, 20 uh, countries uh, that have sporadic cases. Uh, about uh, nine of them are still uh, uh, having uh, uh, less than 20 cases. This number was 14 last time, so many countries have moved out of uh, having just a few uh, number of cases. And uh, for these countries with sporadic cases, it's a higher chance for control if the uh, control measures are scaled up and uh, if uh, also appropriate public health measures are in place and followed by the communities. Next one. Uh, this uh, to show uh, that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, if we had Algeria, uh, we have top six countries uh, that uh, with uh, themselves uh, uh, counting for uh, more than uh, 60 uh, per 60 percent of the, the cases. And uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, we have Egypt, uh, Morocco, uh, Djibouti, and T Tunisia that have also uh, more than 700. Uh, some of them have even uh, more than 3,000 uh, if we look at uh, Egypt and uh, 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 Morocco. Uh, the challenges around uh, um, uh, our uh, region, uh, the first uh, element is about, uh, it's the next slide, uh, about uh, effective uh, uh, coordination. We have uh, uh, different layers of coordination in countries. Uh, it's a good point to bring it uh, at higher level to, uh, uh, in most of the cases, is uh, within the prime minister of the president's office. But the challenge is that uh, this uh, coordination sometimes are disconnected from the technical coordination that should guide actually uh, most of the decision. Uh, if not, it's become political decisions that are not linked to evidence. So it's one of the challenges that we are facing our regional director has set um, a, a video conference with ministers start, starting today to interact uh, directly with ministries of health on how best we can improve this one. Uh, the other one is the insufficient testing uh, capacity is critical for the control interventions and it's a challenge because we have a, a major gap on the market. Uh, so we are urgently looking at also rapid uh, a test mechanism that can help uh, to fill this gap. Information sharing 
uh, we are receiving information from all the countries, but not at the level that we wish. Uh, mainly uh, what we call the line listing is that in comprehensive information around a single case is only few countries that are sharing this data, making difficult the analysis uh, to uh, uh, see the, the trend. And then we have gap in terms of uh, protective equipment and uh, also the issue of contact tracing is still average. It's required involvement of communities uh, to uh, actually scale up this component that is critical. And then the last one is uh, uh, effective, the effectiveness of uh, the uh, confinement measures that should be uh, uh, strengthened with uh, what we call enabling interventions that would be, uh, for example, food distribution, uh, water supply, soap, uh, all these that can help uh, the public health uh, measures to be uh, effective. This includes also active case search. So having confinement alone cannot solve. And the last point is that this outbreak could last longer. So um, we should try to see what are the measures to put in place to keep controlling while resuming some of the activities because it does have also a huge impact mainly on uh, fragile households uh, that cannot afford that these measures last longer if they, they, are, they are not going along uh, with uh, uh, supportive intervention. So I will stop here. This is uh, roughly uh, what I was to uh, mention. Um, uh, sorry, there was a, a, a last slide that was uh, showing also some of the uh, initiative that uh, uh, we have we started to fill the gap of logistics. We start what we call a solidarity uh, um, flight uh, with uh, uh, some of the partners uh, like uh, WFP, World Food Program, uh, Ethiopian Airline to dispatch a supply in countries. It's working, uh, but uh, some of the gap that uh, uh, private sector can look at is uh, uh, laboratory. Uh, protective equipment, items for treatment centers, uh, information uh, technologies, as well as uh, uh, some of the enabling uh, intervention, food distribution or non-food item. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yao, for providing that very efficient briefing on what is happening across the continent. And we thank you and we thank all of the medical professionals who are out there every day on the front lines um, looking to um, help and protect us and hopefully get us to the other side at some point. So we appreciate your expertise. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Last Wednesday, we launched with our initial webinar on leadership in times of crisis facilitated by Professor Linda Hill of Harvard Business School. And in that session, we explored the concept of leadership to lead in times like these. If you wish to view that video, it is available along with all the information about this series. Um, at virtualconferenceafrica.com. Some of you provided feedback to us that you would like to know a little bit more about who you are sitting next to virtually in this webinar. So who is with us today? We have had roughly 10,000 people register for the series. Not everybody participates in every, um, every one of the webinars, but there have been 10,000 registrants overall. You come from 81 countries, 41 countries in Africa, 40 throughout the world. The largest representation is from Nigeria, followed by South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, and Ethiopia. Outside of the continent, the US and the UK are the countries with the largest number of participants. You come from some of the largest companies in the world, including Microsoft, Google, Facebook, from Exxon, Mobil, and Shell, from Unilever, Colgate, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America. The multilaterals, are, uh, the multilaterals are on the line from the World Bank, the IFC, the African Development Bank, the Development Bank of Southern Africa. Banks from across Africa are on the line, including Zenith Bank, First Bank, EcoBank, and many colleagues from Standard Bank. There are diplomats and policymakers from South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Tanzania, among others. We have academics from Harvard, from Lagos Business School, Oxford, Wits Business School, Howard University, the University of Lesotho, Technical University of Kenya, Ashesi University, and the Uganda Christian University, among many others. The hospitality sector is on the line. Ethiopian Airlines, South African Airlines, 
Delta Airlines and United Airlines, and Tribe Hotels in Kenya, among many other regional hospitality players. The mining sector is here, from Anglo-American to the Palabora Mining Company in South Africa. We have a large number of middle market companies across many sectors, including energy, real estate, and agriculture. And we have many entrepreneurs and founders of SMEs. We also have several major NGOs at the table. 80% of you have the title CEO, Managing Director, Chair, Executive Director, Partner, CFO, Group Head, or other C-suite title. In terms of sectors, the two largest sectors are financial services and professional services, followed by energy, manufacturing, technology, and education. And then there's a smaller tier that includes healthcare, media, and real estate. We asked when you registered um, what your biggest concern is with respect to COVID-19. And I'd like to share three responses with you. These are some of the things that we heard and we've had so much feedback. And so I've read almost all of those 10,000 responses to see what is on the minds of the participants. One participant said, as a practitioner in the tourism and hospitality industry, the listed issues below are my greatest concern. One, our operations have been suspended until further notice. Two, because of the suspension of operations, revenues are not forthcoming, hence cash flow challenges. Three, the future impact of COVID-19 on the travel, tourism, and hospitality industry is expected to worsen as business travelers, who most often are the high paying guests, would be cautious of traveling to do business conferences, but would rather adopt technology enhanced business conferencing materials. Four, the cost of doing business in general would be impacted as the hotels and tourism sites would need to provide more facilities to meet the hygiene and safety protocols of guests and clients. Another one of our participants today said that I'm concerned about the crippling effect of the, on the economies of the African nations and the effect of the sit-at-home order on an increase in crime and other social vices and on indigents and masses who depend on daily, their daily hustle to fend for their families. How do they survive? Will there be social unrest? And we've heard this concern from several people leading up to the call today, particularly in some of the major cities in Lagos and in Kaduna, we hear. Um, the economic impact on Africa as a whole is what another participant said, particularly simple tips and suggestions on how we can recover from it using the 1918 Spanish flu as an, in, as an instance. The current buzzword is now the new normal, but we know that when and if they find a vaccine, we will go back to the usual way of doing things. How do we drive a culture that is more dependent on technology, especially in our African government peristatals? How do we seize this opportunity to move Africa to a more developed state? So, as you can see, our panelists have a tall task today, and that is to address a wide range of issues, starting at the company level to the industry level and broader societal concerns from one's local community to the national and continental level. As we begin, I'd like to provide you with an understanding of how those of you on this, on this call are thinking about liquidity issues. So we're going to take a poll. And we will share those results with you instantly. We have two questions that we would like to ask you that will help to give everyone, especially our panelists, an understanding of who they are talking to today. We are going to move to the first poll question at this time. How do you expect your business revenues to change next month compared to last month? So there are several options here. Expect them to increase, expect them to remain the same, expect to decrease by various amounts. We see the results coming in. We're going to leave this up a little bit longer to get your answers. Okay, so quite interesting results. Uh, these results tell us that only 20% approximately expect revenues to remain the same or increase. So 80% expect revenues to decrease. Only 11% expect them to decrease by less than 10%. And shockingly, a large number of people, 23% expect revenues to drop by 23%. To another quarter, roughly expect revenues to drop between 25 and 49%. And it looks as if we've got about 23% uh, think that revenues will decrease by over 50%. So this is some pretty, um, important information that our panelists um, have as they prepare their uh, remarks, as they get into the conversation with you, we see that the picture is not a pretty one with respect to revenue. 
We have a second question for you, um, again, focused specifically on liquidity. And we're asking you, in terms of liquidity, how do you expect your cash position to change in the next month compared to last month? And here the choices are expected to increase, expected to remain the same, expected to decrease by a little, expected to decrease by a fair amount, expected to decrease significantly. I think we've got a good number in, so we can take a look. And again, the liquidity uh, response follows the change in revenue. Um, only about 18% expected to remain the same or increase, and the other 80% expected to decrease. 22% expected to decrease a little bit, and about 60% think that it's going to decrease by a fair amount or significantly. So that sets the tone for the tough conversation we need to have today. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our, our moderator and our panelists. I'd like to start with our moderator. We couldn't have a better moderator for this complex topic. We have Kunle Elibute. He is a senior partner of KPMG in Nigeria and chairman of KPMG Africa. He has over 36 years of professional experience advising clients in the private and public sectors in Nigeria, West Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Prior to assuming the role of senior partner, Kunle has headed various sectors, including the financial services industry, and more recently, the infrastructure, government, and healthcare groups within KPMG. We're very grateful to have you here, Kunle. We also thank Hakim Bella Osagi for getting you on board with this initiative. I will also introduce the panelists. And I'm very privileged to say that all of the panelists that we have here today are friends. Um, you can read their biographies on our website, but I'd like to add my own little personal perspective to their introductions so that you can see them as I do. And that is that we have an incredible collection of business leaders, leaders among leaders on our panel today. Any one of them would make a fantastic keynote speaker on their own, and yet we have all three. Well, Leila DeWitt is the CFO of GE Africa, and she is among the most fast-tracked women in corporate Africa. I had the pleasure of interviewing her several years ago when we did a piece on the women leading GE Africa. And to this day, her video is one of the most viewed pieces of content on Africa.com's YouTube channel. You'll soon hear from her today and understand why that is the case. She's deeply committed to mentoring women and people of color within GE. She started at GE as an intern in college and was a rising star and in 15 short years has shot straight to the top. And she's one of a handful of women CFOs of a major corporation on the continent. After you hear from her, you will want, you will want to hear more and you're invited to watch my interview of her on the Africa.com YouTube channel. In that video, she provides great guidance to women who are rising the corporate ladder. The second panelist that we have, Amasu Tedese, the president and chief executive of the Trade and Development Bank, is someone I've known for over 20 years. Believe it or not, I was his finance professor at Vitz Business School many years ago, so I guess I did a decent job. He is a once-in-a-generation leader for the Trade and Development Bank, who in his eight-year career has transformed the development bank that serves 22 countries in Africa by growing the bank's asset base from $1 billion to over $6 billion. He has driven the bank to receive several rating upgrades and has increased its capital and funding several fold. Last year, he won the prestigious African Banker of the Year Award. And in one of the few pieces of good news that I've heard in the last many weeks, just yesterday, Admasu virtually accepted an award in London. I, I don't know how that was done, perhaps over Zoom, Admasu. He accepted an award yesterday uh, for TD Bank being named the best trade financier bank by the Trade Finance Global. His social impact on East Africa is meaningful, and I know that in the last week he has personally been on the phone negotiating with the United Nations to get ventilators for East Africa. Welcome, Admasu. Sim Shabalala, the chief executive of Standard Bank, is also someone that I've had the privilege of knowing for over 20 years. We first met when he was in his first job as a junior banker, and I was being recruited to a job where I would have been his boss. I didn't take the job probably because I realized that Sim did not need a boss, not then or at any point thereafter. He was wise beyond his years at that time in his life, and now he has ascended the corporate ladder and that wisdom has been bestowed on larger and larger groups of stakeholders. He is also a once-in-a-generation leader for Standard Bank. 
As an example, at the start of this pandemic several weeks ago, a member of the Standard Bank staff shared with me how awed she was by his expansive thinking. Among other messages that he provided to the bank staff was his reference to F. Scott Fitzgerald's quarantine letter from France during the Spanish flu outbreak in 1920. It takes a special banker to reference classic literature during the chaotic moment in which we find ourselves. I read that letter and it is indeed a useful reference point to where we are today. And I recommend that everybody read that letter. I also would like to just thank Sim for being the person he is and making sure that he has brought other people along behind him. And I wanna make sure that we know that he's going to help uh, and play a very important role in South Africa, leading his institution and the broader community. So with that, I'm finished with my introductions and I'd like to turn this over to Kunle and these three remarkable panelists to tackle some pretty tough issues for which there are no easy answers. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, thank you so much for that um, introduction. Uh, and thank you for, for, for giving context <coughs> to, to this topic, which is a very important topic for many businesses across, across the continent. Um, I have a few slides. I don't know if, if you're going to show the slides so everybody can see them. Uh, and the topic is around managing cash flow when revenue and funding uh, dry up. So my first slide, uh, I want to put this also in context. Uh, in Africa, we're not just facing the COVID-19 um, uh, challenge. Uh, I see it as a, as a twin, twin shock. Um, because first of all, you've got the COVID-19 shock, which, which is a global and domestic pandemic. But also you've got the economic shock due to a falling demand of a number of major commodities which Africa you know, is, is essentially at the center of. Um, you know, as, as we know, I mean, especially in Nigeria where I'm from, the oil price has, has, has gone south, uh, which means that you know, it's a huge challenge for, for the government of Nigeria in terms of export earnings. Um, across many countries in Africa, you know, commodity prices are not doing too well. And even if they're not doing too well, the volume of exports of commodities has also shrunk because of global demand uh, has tanked across across the globe. And then, of course, you've got these countries that that basically that also you know, rely on tourism, and with the lack of air travel, for example, uh, you know, uh, you know, globally, uh, tourism also has has taken a big hit, and the airlines therefore will be affected, the hotel industry will be affected, all the, and tourism, as you know, is a labor-intensive industry, which means all the all the people who work and serve in that industry, for example, will be out of work. So if, if you look at it, a twin shock, those twin shocks affect a number of things. They affect the supply, they, they create supply shocks, they create demand shocks, and they create financial shocks. And what is the impact of these shocks? Um, and I've got a number of, 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 of areas to, to look at. First of all, is on the fiscal and, and government for, uh, revenue side. Uh, these shocks will, will, will present real revenue pressures and, and debt sustainability issues from, from many countries. As we know, the AU chairman has put together a, a, a small committee of, of you know, high level African experts to try and negotiate with the IMF uh, some sort of debt forgiveness or interest rates, uh, you know, forgiveness for many countries in Africa. Uh, on the monetary side, uh, many countries are going to face um, exchange rate, um, you know, volatility. Uh, it's already happening in South Africa, it's happening in Nigeria, for example. Um, you know, these also, uh, are big, big challenges in terms of you know, importing inflation, for example, uh, and, and impacting you know, uh, the fact that countries cannot be able to afford to import the key essentials they require during this point, during these during this trying times. It's going to affect financial markets, you know, because we'll see decline, decline in, in portfolio investors, in foreign, foreign direct investments, uh, and reduce access to credit, global liquidity tightens, and that, therefore many countries and many corporates in Africa uh, will have challenges. Uh, it's going to affect businesses and firms. Um, you know, it's going to affect the business model for, for, for an operating model for many, for many companies, uh, as well as, as some sectors. Uh, as we heard, for example, you know, the airline industry is one major interest, industry that is, is, a, is a complete standstill as we speak right now. Uh, it's going to affect individuals in terms of you know, pressure on income and, and purchasing power. And then finally, social welfare. It's going to put a strain on social pre welfare frameworks that support the poor. Because as you know, in Africa, many, many people in Africa you know, the lack of population in Africa depend on daily incomes, uh, either in the construction sites or in local markets, for example, and therefore don't have enough, don't have enough money to even stock up food for more than a, more than a day. 
so these people are going to be significant, significantly impacted. I know that in my country, Nigeria, there's a huge effort by the private sector to support uh, you know, the, uh, the poor. And I'm, I'm sure the same is happening across the continent as well. So for, for businesses, managing liquidity at this challenging time will be very critical. Uh, you know, the back, backdrop of, of the twin shock I just described. And so therefore, proactive, frank, bold, and well thought out decisions will be required by, by many business leaders. And, and I, I want to give you three possible steps to managing liquidity in a period of crisis. The first step is to establish cash, cash position of the, of, of, the, of the organization. And at different times, you know, first of all, there was, you know, just before the pandemic started, you, you Examine what is your cash, cash position, right up until when your country goes into lockdown. You need to establish it again, you know, again just before the lockdown, uh, because during the lockdown, you know, the, the cash the liquidity will actually get to zero during lockdown. If 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 you had any at all prior to prior to when you went into lockdown, uh, and of course you need to establish your cash position on a daily basis, you know, at the, at the end of the day or first thing in the morning, and to so for and to determine exactly how you use that liquidity on a daily basis. Uh, Secondly, you need to take actions to defend or protect and improve the current position where possible, and I'll come to some, some points around that. And then finally, you need to communicate and manage relevant stakeholders. Again, I'll come to, to who those stakeholders are. In terms of establishing the cash position as quickly as possible, which is on my next slide, uh, first of all, you need to de develop a robust cash flow forecasting process. And that cash flow forecasting process must have a number of scenarios. Uh, you should have a scenario as probably your best case, your, you know, so, so your moderate case and your worst case, you know, because at any point in time, depending on what happens to the pandemic in your country, you can move very quickly from best case to worst case or, or vice versa. Okay. Then you need to analyze immediate and near-term cash requirements. You know, of course, one of the biggest near-term cash requirements is, is payroll, and whether or not you can meet, meet payroll. Uh, another one, of course, would be, you know, obligations to, for statutory payments. Uh, another one would be to, to vendors and to creditors where possible. And of course, if you also owe, owe your bank um, funding as well, interest, interest, interest rates and, 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 and also uh, principal payments. You then need to then perform what I call a set analysis, modeling the worst case scenario. So in other words, if you model the worst case scenario, you then say to yourself, can I survive? And if I can't survive, what are my actions? One action, for example, would be to, you know, go to your bank very early in the process, you know, arrange a credit line if you haven't got one already. If you've got a credit line, can you expand that credit line to, to actually take, to take a lot more? And then in either case, you should draw down, you know, fully whatever you, your bank has agreed for you. So you have the cash ring fence in an escrow account ready to use once you hit the worst case scenario. Okay. Um, also, you may have to say, go to shareholders at this point in time and say, look, shareholders, uh, can we get some short-term funding, for example? You know, I, I know one or two corporates, for example, in Nigeria who issued, you know, have done a bond program during this period and, and pension fund managers who have money to, to invest in, in, in uh, on a daily basis. You know, participate in that, in that bond program, for example. You may have to go to shareholders. You may have to go to you know other parties to to, to, raise, to raise money in the show very quickly. You need to determine whether you have any foreign currency or local currency needs. Uh, if you have if you have foreign currency needs to continue to import inventory, for example, uh, you need to determine whether or not where you get that from, or whether you have enough to be able to support your imports. Uh, local currency needs, of course, uh, for for the digital run of the business. And then finally, you need to update your business plans, budgets. With realistic figures. Now, this is a big, a big challenge because what, what is realistic will change based on the situation in, in your environment, you know, based on whether or not you're going to partial lockdown or you're going to full lockdown, for example. And if you're in lockdown, for example, how long you'll be in lockdown? Um, you know, in, in China's case, for example, we, you know, we understand that when Wuhan went to full lockdown, for example, liquidity went to absolutely zero. So only businesses that had any cash at all were able to survive through that, through that period. Then you don't need to think of ways of how you can defend and protect and improve the current position. What, what, what kind of things can you do to defend uh, your current position? You need to implement what I call cash conservation measures and instill it, its consciousness in the organization. So there are three ways to do this. One is what is essential? How, how can you prioritize those cash generation outflows, those things that you need to, you must do, okay? You know, licenses and permits, key trade, trade, trade creditors and, and, and vendors, and maybe security expenses, for example, or payroll. What can be deferred or staggered? Okay. You know, as payments to non essential vendors, can you postpone them or can you stagger them or, or, or can you agree moratoriums, even with your, with, with, with your lenders, for example? And then finally, what can be canceled? 
at this point in time. Travel is obviously, clearly, is one thing you can cancel. Uh, are there any force major forces that to explore? I know, for example, in, in the oil industry in, uh, in, uh, across the globe, oil companies are actually you know, you know, imposing the force major now on, on many vendors, many contractors, because with the way oil prices have gone, uh, some parts of the world negative, uh, there's really no cash flow to be able to meet you know, obligations in the next in the three, two to three months, for example. Um, so you're going to have to cancel stuff, or, you, know, you just can't afford to meet at this point in time. Training, for example, is another one, for example, where you can, you can cancel unless you want to do training uh, virtually. And then what can you improve during this period? Uh, you need to drive improvements in debt collection. You need to go out there to your customers and collect as much as you can collect. You, know? um, you need to explore credit lines with financial institutions and draw down immediately where you can. Uh, you need to explore government grants and waivers for your organization, employees, and customers. So some countries have put in place programs for SMEs, for example. So large corporates can possibly be half of the SMEs, get SMEs to access you know, government grants or government funding uh, to be able to stay alive during this period, so at least they're there. So you need to support those customers, your distributors and wholesalers, such that you know, when, when the pandemic is over, these guys are still available to support you in your business. And then finally, you need to consider disposal of any non-essential assets. This, this one will be challenging, because there's no liquidity out there to, to, to pay you for the, that, that asset. This, this will not happen at all. Then, communication to relevant stakeholders. You know, first of all, identify all relevant stakeholders shareholders, your board, employees, uh, government, customers, trade, and other vendors, and financial institutions. And also define exactly how you're going to communicate to them. You know, employees is one, for example. You know, uh, one, example, one, one, example, one, one example we use in our business is we have regular webinars or regular internal webinars with our employees just to update them on what the business is, what the business is doing financially, what the business is also doing from the point of view of liquidity. Because many employees are concerned as whether well, would they, would they have their jobs? And if they have their jobs, would their pay still be in full? Yeah, we're going to get 20% cost on pay or 50% cost in pay, for example. They need, they need to know very quickly so they can plan. Uh, secondly, assess the impact on each, on each stakeholder. This requires understanding where possible their current financial position, their likely reaction, and issues they may raise, for example. Uh, of course, you know, those employees that you probably are on a short term contract, for example, that you don't actually require right now are the ones who probably suffer most, for example. But as much as possible, you want to. You want to, you know, keep as many employees on, you know, within within the you know, liquidity that you can. Uh, if you can't pay them in full, of course, you know, you probably need to uh, think of, you know, cutting pay to some some extent, but keeping them at least as employees so that after this period, you know, they, they can come back to work uh, normally again. And then finally, also you need to put proactively engage stakeholders to manage expectations and mitigate the impact of their reactions. Uh, that's that's important. Uh, your creditors and, and, your, and your other vendors and, and, your, and, your, and your bankers. Finally, you need to document the basis of decisions reached and, 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 and steps taken so that you, at least when you document it on a regular basis, you can look back on those decisions and determine whether or not the decisions you took were, were the right ones before you then move forward to, to, to the next year or the next week. So in, in conclusion, yeah, so I can bring other speakers on, uh, this pandemic is a medical crisis. Uh, it's rap rapidly leading to an economic crisis and actually may become a financial crisis. So it, it may actually be a three-pronged crisis, medical, economic, and financial. As the crisis continues to evolve, businesses must be nimble, ready to adapt quickly to the possible new normal, and instead of waiting for the return to normalcy. Because normalcy, we don't know when normalcy will come back. And even if the pandemic is over at some point in the future, you know, whether or not we'll come back to where we were before the pandemic, it's very unlikely. You know, for example, someone talked about you know, business travel. Business travel is not likely to happen the way it used to happen before. And therefore, the, the airline industry, the hotel industry, will have to be completely disrupted you know, post, post this period. Uh, liquidity is and will be very critical in the coming days to months. And then finally, quick, frank, bold, and well thought out decisions will determine which companies will survive and those that will not survive. So at this point in time, uh, I'd like to hand over to, to Wilela. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Wilela, you know, being the G of, of Africa, she, uh, she can give us her perspective from a multinational conglomerate perspective. Thank you. Hi, great. Thank you, Kunle. Um, I have just one slide that I'm going to share just to help guide the discussion. But as Kunle mentioned, I'm here to be able to provide just some of the some similar messages, um, particularly from the context um, of a multinational. Um, as a CFO, I'm, I'm in the thick of this. 
Um, but these are things also that are not just relevant to a CFO. I think a leader in any organization um, has to play a very active and engaged role in terms of being able to work through, address, and manage these, um, these times we're in. So I've just got kind of four key messages um, that I want to be able to talk through. Um, just giving some of my perspective, again, as a CFO, but also as a business leader in the region. I think one of the first things that we have to do just from a leadership perspective is we have to accept the challenge that is in front of us today and really just activate ourselves as a leader to be able to work through the circumstances we're in. I think one of the worst things that anyone can do in this time is to essentially be paralyzed um, or try and focus and assign blame or kind of wallow in the, the challenge. But really as a leader, you've got a responsibility to be able to press forward, um, making sound, thoughtful, fact-based decisions. They might be imperfect, but as long as you're learning from them, it's important. Um, and the quote at the bottom of the page, I think is something I, I read in an article a few weeks ago and it's, it's stayed with me, but it says in, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing the worst thing that you can do is nothing. And that, you know, the circumstances we're in, given that there's so much uncertainty and there are a lot of unknown answers and trying to, again, figure out what quote unquote new normal is going to be, there's a lot of ambiguity out there. And so unfortunately, there is no one silver bullet answer to all of this, but the best thing you can do as a leader in your organization is to take the time to understand the facts and to make decisions and really just activate yourself um, as a leader. I think another dynamic also is being able to control emotions of your team. And one way you do that is through um, communicating and engaging. And that's even more challenging in these dynamics of a lockdown and working from home. But again, leveraging the tools and technology that there is you've got to really, this is the time to step up to be the leader to, of your team and to be able just to kind of create certain level of calm and recognizing the importance of tone at the top. But as you're going through this, you just have to be very honest with yourself and take a very frank and very pragmatic look at the reality that we're in and accept your responsibility and your role in terms of being able to control what little you can control, but accepting that. The next thing is, again, understanding the situation, and, and Kunle talked through this, but I think the number one fundamental thing that every leader has to be able to answer is, when will I run out of cash? It is a very simple but very impactful question to ask yourself, but it's something you have to do. And the way you do it is just a very simple and tactical cash flow forecast. Kunle talked to it, but have, going through this exercise, whether you do it for a period of, of a four week period or a 13 week period, whatever is relevant for your organization, it's going to give you insights on the timing of when you will run into this challenge and the depth um, of your challenge as well. It's also gonna give you good insights in terms of the sources and uses of your cash, which will then allow you to be able to understand the levers that you have in order to be able to work with. You know, some thoughts and some advice here is you need to be conservative. Um, you be realistic, but also be conservative. You can't assume any significant swings, any significant changes. This is not the time for, for wishful thinking or, or um, hopeful and, and, optimist and optimistic planning. Um, because of this, again, there's just so many unknowns. So erring on the side of conservatism is absolutely important. And once you develop this framework, you need to pace yourself against this framework on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, depending on, again, the nature of your business. And you wanna be able to use actuals, actual data, actual cash receipts, actual cash disbursements to measure your progress so that you can understand in real time how you are progressing and if you need to pivot strategy. But data is absolutely important. And if you don't have the capability or the capacity to be able to do this exercise, to be able to do this analysis, which again is absolutely fundamental in terms of figuring out your path out of this. You need to hire a professional, get somebody as a contractor, whatever it might be, but make sure that this is the area that you absolutely focus on and get grounding and understanding. Now, once you've got that framework, you then have to focus on solving for the challenge. 
both in terms of immediate, kind of what are your immediate cash requirements and needs and the immediate actions you can take, but then at the same time balancing that with what are you going to look like in terms of the long term. And that's, again, why knowing your levers are going to be important. So one thing I suggest is, again, once you have that framework and a good understanding of the sources and uses of cash, you want to be able to develop work streams and focus on trying to get some quick wins um, as soon as possible, whether it's finding expenses that you can hold off on, whether it's you know, holding off on certain CapEx investments, program investments, product launches, if it's certain expenses for non-essential services that you do not need that can be deferred out. But you, whatever it is, you need to make sure you're finding sources that can help bridge you at least in the immediate future, depending on what your circumstances are. You know, financing is also very, very important here. I personally have been spending time talking to some of the partners that we work with in, the, in terms of banks who we work with um, to figure out how we can leverage some of our banking relationships to maybe perhaps help our customers connect to capital to, in order to be able to enable our transactions and also be able to support some of the challenges our customers are facing. Those are some of the immediate actions I'm taking into account as I think about my second quarter and, and how I can try and manage my framework um, as an example. But thinking about some short-term quick wins that you, can, um, that you can accomplish, not only are gonna help your situation, but are also going to be um, you know, highly motivating to the team that you're, you're working with. Now, from the long-term perspective, you need to also think, again, we talk about a new normal, we don't know what that looks like but you do need to take some time to think about what are we going to look like? What does success actually look like in the end? Do I need to focus only on the core? Do I need to think about potentially restructuring my business? Do I need to think about scaling back and focusing only on core operations? And so if that is what your vision is, you need to make sure that whatever that long-term plan is, that it is leading you in that direction. And again, that you're figuring out then what is the capital structure I'm going to need organizationally, uh, in terms of assets, whatever it might be in order to be able to get you there. But as a leader, you not only need to be fire, fighting the fire of the short-term challenges that you're facing today, but you also need to think about what is it that you're going to look like? And again, what does success look like? Now, some of this is also tough as you think about some of the things you have to execute as a leader. And one of the things I always, um, I, I've had to think about a lot is, how do I try and emotionally detach myself and look at things objectively and look at things in terms of what are the most sound business um, decisions I can make for the overall health and survival if my company and business is going to survive this. And that's hard because some of the decisions you might take will be involving salary cuts, you having to forego your own salary, um, having to maybe furlough people, people going on leave of absence, um, restructuring, potentially laying people off. Those are very difficult decisions, but trying to be um, as intentional about emotionally detaching yourself and thinking, again, what does success look like and what's my path to get there is very, very important. Now, if you end up going down that path, you also want to do this with financial integrity. And that means you want to make sure that you're demonstrating that you're optimizing all other expenses as well. But at the end of the day, what's important is not only that you build this plan, but you paint the picture of what recovery looks like. And that again, you know what success looks like and that you can articulate that with confidence to all of your stakeholders. Which brings me to the last point, um, which Kunle also spoke um, so well about, which is around the stakeholder engagement. Once you've got your plan and your vision and whatever it might be, you have to communicate like crazy, particularly with your employee base. You've got to be very consistent and you've got to be very clear in your communication. Craft your narrative, own your narrative. When things are going great, we're shouting through the halls. We, are always happy and excited to be able to share that story and, and to be able to celebrate the wins. But when we've got a challenging period upon us, you know, that's, we tend to talk about them in the form of a whisper. And that's when rumors can spread and can create a lot of uneasiness amongst your employee base, your investors, your vendors, whomever it might be. And so the important thing here is clear 
simple, proactive communication. What is the challenge that I'm facing today? How am I going to solve for it? This is what success looks like. You will restore some confidence. People will feel like they're a part of the solution, but this is absolutely important. And in order to complement this, you wanna be able to support this by making sure that you're sharing data, that you're reporting, having simple dashboards that have leading indicators that are measuring your progress, um, simple things around your percentages of paid on time, um, what is your average day's delinquent? What, um, you know, what is your uh, turnover on your working capital? But whatever it is that you can measure consistently, transparently, but indicators that measure progress um, that you're sharing with your stakeholders, it's very important. And I realize engaging, again, a lot more challenging by working from home, but we've got to be able to leverage the tools and the technology that we have, and, and we have to be very, very intentional about it. Have regular operating mechanisms with your employees, connect with them, understand how they're doing, how they're feeling, share the plans with them, and at the same time, do the same with your investors, your stakeholders, your lenders, your vendors, um, whomever it might be. But as, as I said, again, when you're in a challenging period, the best thing you can do is communicate and engage. And once people understand the vision and people understand what success looks like and what you're working towards, you're more likely to have the buy-in and you do it with confidence. You're more likely to have the buy-in and the support of your employees and your external stakeholders as well. Change doesn't happen overnight, but you know, every little bit of incremental progress you can make towards stabilizing your position um, is relevant. Now, I realize the dynamics in Sub-Saharan Africa are, are particularly challenging because of the, the twin shock that Kunle spoke about, um, the challenges of liquidity, the challenges of FX availability in country. We know that there are a number of governments that have come out with stimulus packages, but these governments have also been negatively impacted by the oil price shock, which now has made, impacted the budgets severely, which I think has also limited the availability of how much those budgets can actually, those stimulus packages can actually be of, of use, especially when you've got such a significant SME base in this region. And I think it's particularly challenging for our smaller businesses out there to be able to try and access those funds versus a large conglomerate who can either benefit from credit lines or to be able to support um, or be able to get access to the stimulus packages. Leverage the relationships that you have potentially with these larger um, firms who have access for advocacy. But this is also where we really are going to need the support of development institutions like IFC, World Bank, AFDB, to come in and help and bridge that gap of what the governments themselves cannot do. Um, so that's just a little bit of perspective on my end and I'll, I'll pass it over to Agmasu now. Greetings everybody. Uh, great to be on this uh, webinar. Uh, I thought I might just start by saluting um, Africa.com and Teresa for bringing us all together with this very timely discussion on the very important issue of liquidity. Uh, of course, spoken like a banker, uh, liquidity is everything. It's a lifeline, not just to businesses, but to sovereigns and indeed households as well. Uh, I think we've had two very, very good speakers who've really laid out the framework. I think Kunle has talked about how best to manage the art of liquidity in a time of crisis. And, 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 and I think all has been said. And I think, I thought I would just come in very, very quickly on a specific angle that would uh, help complete the picture. Because you see, we, we, we're all used to dealing with liquidity issues at the firm level, at the business level, driven by a number of factors. What makes this particular crisis so unusual is its abnormality in the sense that you, do, you don't just have two shocks, you actually have simultaneous shocks happening across sectors across the board and happening globally across the board. So you have a total deflation everywhere. So you can't look east for growth, you can't look west. So you, you, you really have a situation where the system itself is, is go going into some kind of shutdown. And the problem that this poses for, for companies and, and, and even sovereigns is, you know, how do you model so many factors that are going wrong at the same time? Because these are, these are not sequential events that are happening, they're all happening at the same time. And normally when anybody does modeling, you tend to hold one or two factors as fixed and 
you try to have one as a variable or two. So it's very difficult to model in this environment. And I just thought uh, with the cue that Walela gave, I'm just going to say uh, a little bit of the good news, of course, is it's, it's very clear to the world that this is not just firm level management that's required. Uh, there needs to be a global response to deal with the systemic problem. And, 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 and of course, we, we're, we're all aware of some of the big numbers that are heavily reported upon globally, uh, primarily the US, but also in the European Union zone. Uh, we also hear what's happening in parts of Asia. So the good news, of course, is the, the systemic global issues being addressed uh, in a way that can begin to restore global demand, aggregate demand, which, of course, Africa is suffering from. Uh, I, think, I think the challenge really for, for those of us in the continent is trying to put together the picture on what is going to be the fiscal stimulus in the African context. You know, and this, this is really what's kind of missing, and, 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 it, and it actually has a huge impact on liquidity because the fiscal stimulus uh, has a fiscal side, but it also has a monetary policy side. I think African sovereigns have, have, have already begun to take very bold action in terms of relaxing the monetary space so that the local currency environment becomes a little bit more uh, easy, if we can say. I think uh, even, um, even dealing with uh, forbearance uh, issues around loans, not calling in loans, even, even if you don't restructure and in, in, in time you actually accommodate in all sorts of ways. So, so, so there's quite a bit happening uh, in terms of um, you know, uh, accommodating the, the various companies. I think, I think the, the problem is when you start moving away from the local currency space to the hard currency space, then it becomes a little bit more different because clearly you know, importing medical supplies, building hospitals, or introducing stimulus to companies that want to restore their importation of inputs or equipment uh, or to restore foreign direct investment, you need to, to open the taps up for, 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 for hard currency to flow into the continent. And, and, and this has taken a little bit of time because clearly uh, the, the continent has limited capacity of its own to, to act fully in this area. But of course, it doesn't mean African sovereigns are not doing their part. They have been doing their part. Uh, countries like Egypt have announced $6 billion of a stimulus. Kenya has done roughly 1% of GDP. But if you look at the global stimulus, it was 8 trillion US dollars. 8 trillion US dollars amounts to close to 10% of global GDP. And this raises the question, how much of Africa's 2.6 trillion GDP is being put on the table in the form of some kind of stimulus? And I was just doing a back of the envelope uh, you know, analysis to, to, to count the numbers. And I really struggled to get beyond 50 billion, right? So two, 260 billion would give you 10% of African GDP. 50 billion would give you one fifth of that, right? So you're looking at 2% of African GDP in a, in, a, in a best case scenario. Now this was the case when you just look at, at sovereigns and looking at monetary stimulus and the like. I think the good news, maybe just so that people leave this webinar a little bit upbeat, is, is the rest of the world has started to come to the party in a big way. And I think uh, the global IFIs, uh, clearly the IMF and the World Bank uh, taking the lead have, have really uh, made important decisions to, to release um, uh, some space funding. And I think one of the big things that you've all heard, I'm sure, uh, is, is, the, is, is the standstill on debt for, for, for low income countries. And a lot of the low-income countries of the world are in Africa. Uh, there's been uh, a very, a very important uh, decision made also by the G20 ministers of finance to also accommodate uh, low-income countries. But now even the conversation is is beginning to head towards middle-income countries. So, so there is uh, there is finally uh, a shift happening where we're beginning to see the the international community respond to to the need for for Africa to move beyond containment, move beyond lockdowns, and move beyond simply uh, emergency planning at the health level sector. So, so there is uh, quite a bit that's, that's been happening. Um, I think, I think the, the challenge, of course, is um, once the concessional funding and the grant funding is absorbed, there's always an issue of debt sustainability. So, you know, how do you stimulate? Do you stimulate by borrowing more and how much more can you borrow under what terms? 
And so this is where sometimes the, the, the options get a little bit difficult. Uh, and not all countries are in the same space because debt sustainability sits differently in different countries. Uh, but I thought I would just share with everybody uh, some interesting numbers around fiscal space. Not many people would, uh, would, 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 would guess that the majority, the vast majority of African countries have fiscal deficits of well below 5%. The, the vast majority of African countries are sitting about 3%, 4%. And so there's a little bit of room to relax that. So at the, on the local currency side, I think we can expect uh, some more interventions to come through from various sovereigns. Um, and I think at the monetary side as well, interest rates have been reduced. So that is also creating quite a bit of stimulus. Uh, so I think there's, there's some good news, but I think these are actions and measures that take a little bit of time to, to, to actually be felt in, in the various economies. Um, I think I think the one thing just to 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 highlight is um, is is the the point around communication and engagement that both Kunle and Walala highlighted. It is so important because it's not the plan that matters; it's the planning. And things are moving all the time. And and so if you're if you're communicating regularly with all the different stakeholders, you might find that the space to maneuver changes within a week or two weeks. So just keeping that communication going at all times and, and, and watching the space for, for announcements of programs that will be driven by, uh, by some of these uh, stimulus measures that are beginning to come into the African continent. So I just thought I would leave it uh, a little bit upbeat that there is uh, very exciting uh, developments happening. There were two webinars already today on this issue. Uh, this morning, it involved uh, about 20 different development banks from Europe and uh, the, the Asian space as well, the China development banks of this world, the Japanese. And the whole discussion was really about planning for the, the, the post-containment the post period. The whole, the whole question of how does one get Africa back onto a, 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 a robust growth path. And I think there's, uh, there's some very good thinking going on there as well. And, and, and it's all structured around achieving our 2030 development agenda, which is to ensure that, for instance, we deal with the issues of water supply. And one of the issues that hasn't always come up in this discussions around COVID is 56% of, of urban dwellers in Africa have access to clean water. So something as simple as washing your hand becomes very difficult in an environment where there's no access to water, let alone clinics, let alone hospitals. Just to wash your hand is a, is a challenge. So we were discussing also this morning, how do we ensure that the, the world of development finance comes to the party, both on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, but also the climate finance agenda, acting on the Paris Accord, so that Africa can actually get you know, very attractive long-term funding to allow us to leapfrog in the area of green energy and the green economy. So, so I just thought I would link some of these, these uh, related issues and give sure. people some reason to be a little bit optimistic that once we get out of this hairy situation, I think we might have some, some interesting opportunities to rally around. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that at this. Thank you, Kunle. Thank you ever so much, Kunle. Uh, and thank you, Teresa. And uh, thank you to my fellow panelists. It's really a tall order to follow your very comprehensive and thoughtful presentations, but I guess it would be useful to just share some thoughts from a banker's perspective uh, from down south. I'd like to make four quick points, if I may. The first one is that uh, it is very important to emphasize that the global and South African banking industries have entered this crisis in a very strong liquidity position. Most of us are compliant with Basel and the African continent has done a great job, uh, even though we're at different levels of Basel 1, 2, and 3. But I think generally we can be very proud of what we've done as Africans. The reforms put in place after the global financial crisis are clearly necessary on their own terms. With hindsight, it turns out that they are also going to be very useful in this crisis. In general, banks are sound. And the major regional and global banks are extremely sound. In past crises, the financial system tended to transmit and amplify shocks. The reverse is true this time around. We are in the very fortunate position of being able to help to alleviate this crisis 
by dampening and reducing the shock to the economy. There is one caveat in Africa, and each of the speakers just before me has actually made this point. There may be a shortage of dollar liquidity in some African jurisdictions. This brings me to my second point. Banks can certainly assist our clients a great deal during this crisis, but there are some things that we can't and shouldn't do. Obviously, commercial banks can't increase the dollar supply, as I've just said. That must be left to central banks, and one must certainly give credit to the central banking community for their commitment to pumping liquidity into the system. It immediately follows that commercial banks need to play in our lane. For instance, we need to continue to be faithful transmitters of monetary policy. In many jurisdictions throughout Africa and the world, central banks have cut interest rates and reduced capital and liquidity ratios. They've done this to stimulate more borrowing and to enable more lending. Commercial banks, therefore, have an obligation to pass on interest rate cuts immediately and in full and to provide additional lending support to their clients. Equally though, the commercial banks can't put the interests of our clients at risk. An obvious but essential point is that banks' clients are savers as well as lenders, and they are institutional investors as well as corporate borrowers. Whatever else we do in this crisis, our first duty remains to safeguard our depositors' funds. We must, therefore, continue to apply the usual rules of good lending practice, summarized in the immortal three Cs. Whenever we lend, we must be sure that the borrower has collateral, capacity, and character required to meet their obligations when they fall due. There's an obvious temptation, and Kunle alluded to it, on corporate clients to draw down in full on their facilities to the maximum without regard to what is actually required and to then redeposit the money on call. I love Kunle, but I must respectfully disagree with him on this point because I take a different view to him. This practice places unnecessary strain on banks' capital and liquidity. Therefore, while it might be a good individual move and a very smart one at that in the short term, it's bad for the economy in the medium and long term. This is because it reduces banks' ability to lend to other clients who need the liquidity and who may well be in dire straits. Since economies are tightly interrelated, restricting credit to others through practices such as these ends up being counterproductive for one's own firm. Third point, even bearing all these constraints and complexities in mind, we can still do a great deal to minimize the distress faced by our personal clients and keep our business clients at least ticking over. Starting with the retail and commercial side of things and using South Africa and Kenya as examples, in both countries, we are offering installment relief to categories of clients, including low-income earners, students, and small and medium enterprises. In cases where clients have credit insurance, we're helping them to claim to cover lost income or retrenchment. We can also reduce insurance premiums in some cases, for instance, in South Africa, in specific places where clients are driving less during this lockdown, we are refunding a proportion of their premiums. We have also reduced transaction fees in several countries. In Nigeria, as Kunle would know, for example, we aren't charging settlement fees for using our points of sale machines, and we have waived interbank transfer fees on digital transactions. One initiative that I particularly like emerges from a service that we have already developed in South Africa called Simply Blue. Kunle, you won't be surprised that it's called Blue. This is essentially an online business in a box for SMEs, enabling them to set up a retail website and payment system in a matter of minutes 
and so shift to online retail very cheaply and very quickly. On the corporate and investment banking side, our view is that there is no substitute for client by client engagement. We do not believe that it is practical or appropriate to contemplate sectoral or segment-wide relief measures. In every case, we need to distinguish between existing and new clients, between expansionary and crisis-driven requests, and between local and foreign currency funding. We also need to think carefully about the availability of additional collateral remediation actions by clients to reduce expenditure, the strength of management, the business's market position, funding available from shareholders, as Kunle pointed out, as well as government and other lenders, and our own funding capacity. Let me emphasize, however, that this is not a euphemism for saying no to our corporate clients. Over the last month, we have provided several hundred million dollars worth of relief to many of our corporate clients. We have also been able to assist corporate clients in helping their staff. And we're offering concessions with respect to pricing of our advisory work during this crisis. Finally, let me reiterate that the commercial banks will be able to do a lot more lending in support of the post-pandemic recovery thanks to the regulatory changes made by central banks, including the South African Reserve Bank. In essence, these rule changes make it possible for us to lend larger sums for longer periods against our existing capital and liquidity. In some countries, such as South Africa, governments will also be able to provide fiscal support, for example, through loan guarantees provided by ministries of finance or through development finance institutions. All such initiatives are certainly also to be welcomed. It is very useful to remember that banks can, as a rule of thumb, make loans up to 10 times the value of their equity. So interventions like these can be very efficient ways to kickstart the recovery. As it happens, President Ramaphosa announced South Africa's loan guarantee scheme just last night. It had been developed in partnership with South Africa's commercial banks and provides around $15 billion in guarantees against which we can lend to companies with revenues below $20 million a year. Standard Bank's view is that this is an extremely well-designed program that compares favorably with the best in the world, including the United Kingdom and the Swiss schemes. It provides a great deal of support, but crucially, it does not require banks to lend in an unsustainable or unsound way. In other words, it provides a very valuable bridge to get us across a very difficult period, but it doesn't introduce any longer term distortions that could delay or prevent the post pandemic recovery. And that's where I'd like to end with my fourth and final point, talking about the recovery. We don't know exactly when the recovery will come, nor do we know if it will be a V or a U or a Nike swoosh, but the recovery will undoubtedly come. To my mind, banks can be most useful of all in reinforcing and accelerating the recovery phase when it happens. And this in turn has two implications, which basically summarize everything I've been saying. First, it is essential that the financial system remains sound. Second, we need to do everything we can to keep business of all size alive as going concerns. Probably not very profitable, but also not shutting down or laying off permanently. There's a risk that once businesses stop, they never restart, and that the mechanism that turns a relatively short shock into a multi-year depression is exactly that. It's imperative that we avoid that. Thank you very much, Kunle. Let me hand back to you. Sim, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, all, all the three speakers. Uh, I think we've done an excellent job in trying to dissect this issue from different perspectives. And now we're going to go into a Q&A session. Teresa, do you want to step in now so that we can give our, our audience the time to, to interact with the panelists with their questions? Yes, thank you very much, Kunle. And thank you to all the panelists for some very insightful remarks over what we know is a very difficult um, set of issues. Our first question is going to come from 
Oketka Makola, who is from South Africa and heads risk discovery, risk management at Discovery. Lena, you spoke about effective communication between parties being a key input when you're making some of these liquidity decisions. Now, where organizations have a large number of outsourced arrangements or third parties supporting them from an operational perspective, how, how, are, or how do you suggest that those organizations ensure um, that they're receiving accurate, timely, and relevant information? I think it's as simple as just having operating mechanisms. Um, and just making sure that there's just consistent, clear messaging um, that's relevant to, to that individual population. But having, whether it's a, a weekly kind of touch point or a catch up that you have in order to be able to connect with them. Um, but I think it's, again, just having an operating mechanism and an operating rhythm, some sort of structure in order to be able to manage your communications. And so oftentimes we're in, when we're in a situation with this, some of our biggest partners are our legal function. Um, you know, we talked about force majeure and stuff like that. We HR function, because again, a lot of it has tied to employee communications. Um, and then also our communications function. And with them, we partner to develop communication plans depending on who the audience is. So if you have someone in your organization that is a comms um, specialist, what you want to be able to do is work out an actual communications plan with them that is a messaging calendar, be it that, it's the frequency, the timing, the length, the content, the audience, that kind of thing. But the biggest thing I could say is having an operating mechanism that complements your plan and, and how and what you want to communicate. Our next question comes from Malungu Mashalemba, who is with Standard Chartered Bank in Zambia, and she has a question for Admasu. Hi, thanks. This is Malonga Mitchell. I'm actually based in Singapore, but I'm Zambian uh, by nationality. So Admas has actually already part partially answered my question by giving us stats on the fact that only $50 billion equivalent um, has been provided as a stimulus. And Sim also talked about this a little bit. My question, my fundamental question is how can African central banks and ministries of finance be more agile in their response to economic shocks? So we're tracking the response by central banks globally, which are implementing things like allowing uh, banks to convert loans, foreign, foreign currency loans to local currency. Um, there's been deferment of tax payments, which creates some sort of liquidity in the market, credit protection, public guarantees to ensure that the economy continues to tick. But when I compare that to the actions by African central banks and ministries of finance, it's not consistent. It, there's no depth and we're not really exploring the levers that we can pull. So my question to you is what can we do to actually build that capacity so that the next time we have another coronavirus, we're not scrambling to come up with an appropriate action. Well, this is um, a very, very well thought through question clearly. I I think um, we're all trying to understand the issue of turnaround time. I think uh, we are not the only ones who made assumptions that Corona wouldn't hit us uh, in a serious way. I think uh, there's um, a pattern of that kind of assumption that's been made globally. And so I, I, think, I think it's only now that it's becoming very clear that um, the, the current wave of, of infections and what that's doing uh, to, to African economies by way of the responses that have been taken. I think it's just taken a little bit of time, unfortunately. And, and you're right in that uh, we need to learn lessons and make sure that going forward, uh, we have uh, you know, scenarios in place so that we can activate emergency plans much quicker. Uh, I think it's also made it very clear that we are still very vulnerable as Africa, just in terms of basic infrastructure around water, sanitation, and, and, and just medical infrastructure as a whole. I think we've had some successes over the past decade or so, and perhaps now we realize it's, um, uh, it's time to go back to, to relook uh, the gaps in the medical sector. I think we've been looking at other areas of infrastructure, but social infrastructure now needs to uh, be refocused upon. And I think as that happens, and as the world also gets more serious about SDG financing at a global level, because clearly, uh, whenever you invest in these sectors, there's always going to be a significant dollar component because we're always importing equipment. Even contractors, in many cases, unfortunately, are also paid in hard currency. So there's always going to be uh, that international 
international dimension, that foreign dimension in the international accounts that requires foreign financing. And, and I think the, the good news is uh, there is a, a growing momentum building around creating uh, space uh, for, for longer term credit uh, to come through to, to the African continent in, in the light of the, the, the major commitments that have been made globally. Uh, so I think it's taking time and your observation, I, I, I share it. I just think it's perhaps the nature of being uh, fragile and being a frontier market where your institutions are just never really uh, at the level that you'd like them to be. So it's, it's work in progress. Our next question comes from Funke Adekoya of Nigeria, who is an attorney specializing in arbitration. Funke, can you hear us? Um, yes, I can. Um, Kule started by telling us how important it is at this time for everyone to manage their cash flow. And that means your collections and on a daily basis updating how much do you, do you actually have. Now my question is for Welela. How does the CFO manage the conflict between managing the company's cash flow as well as paying suppliers, professional service providers who are mm -hmm. chasing collections in order to manage their own cash flow? Yeah, no, I understand. It's a, it's a very fair point because, you know, if you, if the company itself was suffering from this liquidity situation, from their own doing, their own actions, and it was an isolated situation, um, it would be one thing different. But now you're in a situation where this is a collective pain um, and everybody has the same, um, the, everyone is dealing with the same thing, trying to collect their cash and then whatever cash they have, trying to hold on to it. Um, and so this is where you need to um, be very direct and actively engaging with your vendors. Um, and working through if it's restructuring the payment terms and accepting perhaps um, rather than the pre-existing payment terms, perhaps adjusting them a bit. I mean, getting something less than what you were originally expecting to get is better than getting nothing at all. And so this is where negotiating skills are going to be necessary to see if there's any possibility of perhaps being able to renegotiate them. If you've got receivables from customers, offer incentives by offering discounts in order to be able to perhaps collect that cash um, sooner. Um, but then there are also others, this is what, again, when you do that framework and understanding your cash flow, perhaps you've got other sources and uses of cash that are out there. You know, one other thing also to think about is, do you have any assets on your balance sheet today that are perhaps non-essential, that you can perhaps do a fire sale of that you could potentially liquidate and through that be able to be able to um, identify and um, be able to create a new source of cash collection as well. Now, you know, when you think about, especially like when you think about a CFO, you've got a couple of different types of CFOs. You've got, and it really just depends on the nature of what your business is. You've got CFOs who are very commercial, who are very good at M&A and really good at structuring deals and transactions. Um, that are centered around the structure of a business. You've got CFOs that are very good from an operational aspect, running a business um, and being able to, to um, basically operate almost like a COO. You've got other types of CFOs that are more kind of commercially focused, very savvy, deal savvy, very um, focused on commercial growth. In this circumstance, you need a CFO that kind of has a little bit of all three. And you have to almost treat it like you're a turnaround CFO. And so when you're thinking about ways to be able to hold on to that cash, it's, it's more than just trying to hold off on paying on your, hold off on paying vendors or collecting cash from your customer sooner. It's looking at that balance sheet and understanding, is there anything I could potentially liquidate here? Can I figure out ways to be able to access certain credit lines or be able to tap into perhaps certain relationships we have with banks, or development institutions, whatever it might be, or leveraging maybe larger partners, like I just I've mentioned before, as a means of being able to get advocacy to support you getting access to stimulus funds, FX allocation, whatever it might be. But it requires creativity, but it, and it also requires a CFO and a business leader who can be able to understand what skills to be able to pull from in order to be able to solve for these challenges. But a lot of it, again, comes back down to being very frank and open with your vendors and asking 
um, and kind of working through a negotiation and to understand what degree of flexibility um, there is and what can be done if you can perhaps if it's a payment that needs to be done in um, in dollars perhaps see if it's possible to then do the, the payment in local currency instead um, but it, it requires some degree of negotiating as such. Baba Mashalugu in South Africa, the CEO of Redemption Capital. Baba, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Do you have a question for Sim? Yes, I do. Um, hi, Sim, and uh, great, great to hear you um, again. Um, my question really relates to the South African stimulus package that was announced last night, which um, is estimated at about 10% of GDP. Um, in light of our recent, obviously, downgrade by the, the last of the credit rating agencies, um, my first question is, and, and the first question is quite general, so please don't worry too much about that part, um, is where the 500 billion rand will come from. But more importantly for me is the knock-on effect of that. Um, with an already compromised um, sovereign credit rating, I wonder if we are going to borrow that amount further um, as part of our stimulus package, what is the potential um, further degradation to our credit rating in our economy? Thank you very much, Baba, and it's uh, so good to hear from you. Um, I think there is no question that the funds have to be raised from uh, external sources including the World Bank, the IMF, the BRICS Bank. And in fact, the president in his speech uh, alluded there too. Uh, it's just not possible that those funds could be generated internally. So that's the first point. If you recall, the Minister of Finance's previous budget uh, indicated quite a tough balancing act between the various demands on the, on the fiscus. And so the simple answer is that uh, those funds clearly have to be raised uh, externally. Secondly, I do believe, however, that the investment community, both domestic and international, has discounted uh, the need to do that. Um, thirdly, it will result, obviously, in a degradation in the debt-to-GDP ratio of the country and the other measures. Uh, but as I say, I do believe that uh, investors have, uh, have discounted this. I think what is really important uh, is that the authorities implement structural reforms that are on the table as a matter of extreme urgency. And again, it's been good to hear ministers and the president speak quite eloquently about the need to get cracking on the various structural reforms. And so I think what we will see uh, in the next phase, um, simultaneous with the stimulus packages, is you're going to see, I think, execution on, on the structural reforms. Our next question is from Cathbert Malindi with African Investments. I'm actually Zambian, but living in South Africa. I'm a venture capitalist as well as an entrepreneur. Uh, the 500 billion announced by South Africa yesterday, which was quite impressive, it just struck me as South Africa is almost out there while the, the African countries are lagging behind. So I get a sense that countries are doing or coming up with stimulus packages on their own almost like working as a silo. So I'm just wondering, isn't there, or what is being done to actually, for uh, African countries to actually work together, as well as African uh, DFIs to work together so that there's an Africa-wide stimulus package, rather than country-specific, so that those countries that are not able to have a stimulus package are helped. Because some countries, I, I get a sense, for example, like Zambia, they may not have come up with a large stimulus package simply because they can't afford it. But at the same time, they want to prevent uh, COVID-19 from wreaking havoc. I think to all the panelists, because I know Sim is very much aware of the 500 billion, but I was just asking maybe to the other panelists what they feel just outside South Africa, what can other African countries do so that this is an Africa-wide solution? First of all, individually, African countries, as I alluded to in my uh, opening remarks, have already done quite a number of things that uh, are meant to address the, the crisis. 
ranging from reduction in cash reserving ratios, reduction in minimum capital requirements, reduction of capital conservation buffers, interest rate cuts. Uh, they've been working with uh, the financial sector in Kenya, in Nigeria. So there's a, a whole slew of activities that have been happening. But I think the colleague who's just asked the question has hit the nail on the head uh, by asking, but what can be done at a continental level? Uh, I do think that our leaders have an opportunity to leverage the African Union and take action collectively uh, and introduce measures that would address uh, medium to long term structural changes to the continent that would uh, help with the movement of goods, people and capital and therefore address uh, the, the, the challenge that we face. So firstly, it's the African Union uh, ha having a scientific and uh, integrated response to COVID-19 as a, as a continent, but then secondly, an economic response as well. Uh, and then, of course, from an economic perspective, to use the leverage that will come from uh, the uh, intercontinental free trade area, accelerate uh, uh, the execution of that, uh, of that agreement and get the economic benefits that arise uh, therefrom. Uh, Teresa, maybe I, I can add as well a few points, um, just following up from Sim. Uh, as you know, the African Union Pre um, Chair is, uh, is, is, is uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, and he set up a, a committee of four you know, very experienced Africans to help to negotiate with the international financial community around you know, African debt in terms of either interest rate moratoriums or postponement of repayments, which will trickle down across, across the continent. That is, he has Trevor Manuel from South Africa on that committee. Uh, the chair is Tijan Chiam, who was the ex CEO of Credit Suisse. He has Ngozi Kunjewela and uh, Donna Kaberuka, the former AFD DB president. So, those four individuals are working together, and I presume they're, they're working together by interfacing with countries on the continent to say what are their needs, what their requirements are, and pulling together you know, all the requirements from the countries across the board, and then going either to the IMF or the World Bank or various multilaterals. I also know that the, I think it's the World Bank has a um, a group of emerging market finance uh, ministers, with the Ghanaian finance minister, for example, sits on, uh, you know, uh, Ken Furiata, and he's also articulating issues for Africa. And then, of course, you know, the FDB raised a six billion dollar, you know, um, you know, uh, social bond, which was fully, fully uh, subscribed, and that funding is available again for African countries. Now, I guess the challenge in Africa is that there's no, there's no African monetary mechanism that can pull this together beyond the African Union. Uh, and so what's been done is, is high level and then getting the countries to tap into it uh, as, as and when. But countries must have their own specific plans. So those plans will throw up what their issues are and then whatever dispensation we can get as a continent will then flow into ensuring that the, that the plans that countries have uh, can actually become become, become useful for the, for the business community. I just thought I would make it very practical and let you guys know that just five minutes ago, a colleague came to me and asked me what should be the pledge for an AU campaign that's currently underway as we are meeting on this webinar to precisely mobilize an African fund. I think some of you may know there is something called the CDC of Africa, the Center for Disease Control for Africa. And this afternoon, actually just before this webinar, there was a discussion uh, at the level of the AU. Um, President Ramaphosa actually shared it with the four people that uh, Kunle made reference to. And there was a hundred business people on that call. And then I was on that call too. And, and there's a huge mobilization going on to, to, to sort of build on what each African country has already been doing within, within the, the domestic space. So there's quite a bit happening. We're focusing also on emergency supplies. We're trying to find ways to order uh, emergency supplies as a block so that we get good bargaining power and we can be felt as everybody scrambles to get specialized equipment in the medical space. There's quite a bit happening in that regard. So it may not be in, carried in the news, but it's, it's beginning to, to take off. There's also uh, other efforts underway uh, at the level of uh, each country working with uh, sub-regional organizations at the COMESA level, for instance. And so uh, it is beginning to happen, but the reality of African economies is we're not so integrated yet to make that the first port of call. The first thing you do is you work domestically because that's where the reality of your economy is. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that real-time information. It's um, exciting to hear that uh, the AU is moving forward in this regard. 
Our next question is from Abdul Aziz Garuba, who's not able to unmute, um, but I will ask the question. Um, the question is, what are some of the good funding and liquidity management strategies for recent startups and very small businesses? We've talked a lot about larger companies, but let's shift the conversation for a moment to small SMEs. What can we do very specifically and tangibly in this environment? Should we continue to pay our bills? How should we proceed? Yeah, I can speak. I mean, in Nigeria, for example, the Central Bank of Nigeria has a 50 billion naira fund for, for SMEs. Uh, and SMEs will have to, will have to um, access that, that funding from, through the commercial banks. And some of that funding also is, is not just around new money, but you know, in terms of, first of all, the lower interest rates for existing intervention funds from 9% to 5%. They've given a one-year moratorium um, you know, on, on, on debt payments, which you know, for new facilities, which have just been negotiated before the pandemic kicked off. Uh, and then I guess there could be some, some, some new cash as well from, the, from, from that fund as well for, for, for SMEs. But most, more importantly, I think also is that you know, in, in many African countries, small businesses, uh, you know, probably startups work with larger corporates. So the, the key at this point in time is to see that synergy between large corporates and small businesses and, businesses and where large corporates can also help to try to dimension the liquidity challenges that some of the SME customers have. Uh, and then access, you know, any of these government grants or government funding schemes for, for some of their for some of the distributors. Now, for, for, for startups, though, who are not yet, you know, uh, cash flow positive or haven't broken even, then this is the, this is, this, this is a test of, of, of the reality of the, business, of the business model, of the resilience of the business model. And whether or not the investors who give money up to now are willing to continue to fund this startup during this, during this period. Uh, because if the investors have confidence in the business model, and this period can test that resilience to see that that, that business can survive this, this period. Then, of course, you know it, it makes sense for them to continue to fund the business, knowing that post this this, this crisis, these businesses will, will turn cash flow positive and then hopefully be much more valuable than would have been the case. Now, if you don't meet any of those criteria as a startup, and you cannot get funding either from government support or from your, invest, or from, from your shareholders or large corporates, then what does it mean? The reality is that your business model has to be looked, either it looked completely and revised, or the business is going to go just go, you know, uh, uh, go bust. And that's reality, you know, unfortunately. You know, so again, there, there will be many decisions we have to accelerate at this point in time. And as, as Wolela said, you know, we, we cannot be emotional here. We've got to really uh, take a look at the business model and say, can, can, it, can, we, can it stand the test of time during this period? If it can, to some, to some respects, and generate some cash flow, uh, even if it's still not cash flow positive, but can ride this period uh, with some, you know, some, some minimal cash flow requirements to do so, then post the, post the crisis, it will come out of it hopefully much stronger. But if you cannot, if, if your cash you know, flow completely dries up in this period, as well as I said, you know, you've got to be realistic. If it dries up and there's nowhere you can get additional money from, then clearly you understand still position and there's nothing you can do about it until, until the crisis is over and go back to talk to your, to your, to your investors. Just, just, just to say that we'll be um, uh, hopefully launching an SME working capital program that will be uh, partly financed out of concessional grant funding. And this will be to give some breathing room to qualifying SMEs uh, in partnership with some donors. And the intent will be of course, to, to help prevent structural damage to these very fledgling SMEs who, who, of course, uh, have to keep paying some level of salaries to keep going during this difficult time. So there's little projects of this nature that are beginning to come up as part of the global uh, coming to the party, as I referred to earlier on. And it'll be rolled out in a couple of countries that have been targeted for this kind of support by international development partners. So I think the SME space will be targeted uh, for some very specific relief. And some of that will be in the form of grants as well similar to what we're seeing in the advanced countries. But of course, the volumes won't be nowhere near as they're needed, so they'll be heavily targeted. So is, um, I wonder if I may also just add, uh, that is to say, um, like all that two other speakers have said, review your capital sources. Uh, and as we've all said on this webinar, various countries have got some very useful uh, solutions designed between the 
private and the public sector, firstly. Secondly, people should review their insurance policies. Uh, don't forget the existence of uh, business interruption uh, insurance. And then thirdly, like any other business, sit back, do scenario planning, figure out which are the most likely scenarios and prepare your business for the most likely scenario. Kuhn, I'm going to come back to you with the questions that you have. You had some questions that you wanted to ask the panelists, so I'm going to let you go ahead and ask one of your questions now. Yeah, one of them, uh, Agmasu, um, was around how can businesses access liquidity for development banks in this period of crisis? And I think the context here, Agmasu, is that there's a perception that, you know, that to raise money from, from, from uh, development banks, typically it has a long lead, lead, lead time. Uh, so therefore, if I wanted to get access, access funding from a development bank, are there any kind of programs you have in place to try and respond to, to businesses that need this liquidity in a, in a shortest possible time period to make it relevant for this, for this, for this period? Uh, yes, it's a good question, Kunle. Again, um, uh, the bottom line is you have different types of development banks. You have some that are very wholesale in nature and uh, don't always deal with uh, large numbers of businesses. And then you have some who are specialized in that way. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the structure and um, profile of uh, development banks. Uh, but I, I can tell you that the bigger development banks who have a lot of firepower uh, tend to look at commercial banks as their partners. So we, we tend to work uh, hand in glove with many commercial banks and we we not just provide lines of credit for them to do, to provide working capital for trade finance or the like, but we also sometimes offer what we call risk participation facilities. So what we'll just tell a commercial bank is uh, just go ahead and do twice as much as you're doing with SMEs, reach out further, take more risk, and we'll share that risk with you on the following basis. So what that does is it actually cuts down the, the very uh, long lead times that would be required if you were to deal with each individual business or SME on your own. Uh, as we all know in this day and age with KYCs and the, and the like, it can be very complicated to go through documentation. So I think the, the best thing that the, that the market can expect from DFIs is to work through commercial banks that have retail networks and that are already well designed to reach uh, small businesses as well as medium-sized businesses. Of course, for our existing clients, we work directly with them. We've, uh, We've honored the global call to be more considerate, uh, where forbearance requests come in. We're looking at uh, reprofiling debt. We're looking at rescheduling debt on a case-by-case -case basis, managing moral hazard in the process. Uh, so we're not doing blanket arrangements, but we're definitely um, accommodating a lot of requests and being uh, very conscientious in these difficult times. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Masu. Uh, my next question is uh, for Walela. What do you think uh, multinational or conglomerates have uh, any kind of financial liquidity synergy options at this point in time? Do you think any of them, these kind of things are available to multinationals at this point in time or, or conglomerates in Africa uh, to be yeah. able to improve their liquidity? Yeah, so I mean, I think we've talked about some of the things we can do just around ways to be able to accelerate cash collection, um, be able to renegotiate debt payments, um, figure out ways to be able to manage your costs, simple practical things as far as travel expenses, and as I said, figure out a way to be able to perhaps help our vendors or our customers and connect them to capital. Um, so that allows me, multinational, to be able to continue to run and operate for me to be able to deliver parts and service gas turbines across the region. Um, but it also helps my customer, my vendor as well, because it gives them a little bit of oxygen as well in terms of um, being able to manage and cope through this. And so. You know, I think the, one of the points that we've made around figuring out if you do have these relationships with, um, if you are an SME and you do have some sort of a working relationship with a big multinational, you know, connect and reach out and see if there's a way to perhaps leverage them to be able to figure out ways to be able to connect you to capital that's needed for you to continue to operate. And, and at the end of the day, for me, it would also be a win-win because it would allow me to continue to execute and operate. Um, so I think, again, trying to figure out ways to be able to, to leverage that relationship is important. But as I said, you know, I speak as a CFO, I speak as a leader, but when I, and when I put my CFO hat on, I, I just have to emphasize the message around, you kind of have to have this mentality of, I need to run this like I'm trying to turn around a business. You have to have that mentality. And so 
It's about the operating rigor. It's about figuring out um, commercially where you're going, what the structure of the business is going to be at the end of the day. And, and if that vision and what looks like success is a very different uh, business model than what it is today, then trying to figure out again, what are those changes you need to make from um, a cost and capital structure to be able to support that. And, and again, um, the other aspect of it, again, is from kind of a banking and M&A perspective of having that skill set to be able to perhaps work with the development banks, the commercial banks, the sovereign wealth funds, the, 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 um, the stimulus packages, whatever it might be, but trying to go after each one of those things. So it's, um, it's a very multifaceted um, approach that's, that's needed. Clearly, one sector that's, that's benefiting from, from what's happening right now is the, is it, is the uh, technology sector, especially telecoms, because all of us have had to, you know, to expand our bandwidth and, and, and use much more data than we've been using before. Uh, we were, we're a data-hungry continent, for sure, but the amount of data that we are consuming now is probably increased exponentially, and we'll continue to do so in the foreseeable future. So I, I expect that the telecoms industry, the, the, the technology industry, for example, will definitely be uh, a winner uh, from this process. The other sector that, 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 is, that is still open for business is, is the whole uh, agriculture, uh, fast moving consumer goods, uh, food industry. Um, so long as the supply chains are working and, uh, and the supply chain uh, you know, is, 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 is made a, 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 a able to, to supply you know, uh, products from the, from the farms into, 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 the, into, the, into the large um, uh, factories and then from there in, into the wholesalers or distributors or supermarkets. The food industry definitely is an industry that governments just cannot afford to close down. And that industry has to step up to the plate to increase capacity as much as possible. Uh, and to be able, because as you see now, as, as people are buying and stocking up in some countries, it's, it's causing inflation because the supply is not, you know, is, it is not up to, the, up to the demand. The demand is, you got demand spikes in some countries and that's, that's increasing inflation. So clearly the food industry is one that, you know, if, uh, if they're able to, to, to mobilize more capital and be able to, you know, produce a lot more than they could do and ensure there's much, much more going through the supply chain, clearly that industry will also start to benefit. And I think financial services as a, as a, as a whole, you know, we cannot do without financial services. Uh, whether it's banking or insurance, we just can't. Kunle, just to add on what you've said, I just thought I should uh, flag that there's been a, a rude awakening on, on our readiness in terms of the medical sector, the health sector. So I think pharmaceuticals will, will have a nice boost. And I think uh, also medical infrastructure clinics, as well as hospitals, uh, we have actually fast-tracked four projects just in the past uh, three months to deal with hospitals that have been kind of on, on, a, on a back burner, but all of a sudden they've got this new lease on life. And so we're seeing um, some very exciting developments in, in, in the medical sector. Uh, I think also logistics is, is getting a nice little boost because of the delivery systems that have now had to come into play in a major way. And so everybody's aware of uh, the importance of, of doing business a little bit differently. And so I see that also as a sector that will benefit. Uh, I think the other uh, unintended uh, consequences of this uh, crisis will be to, to strengthen uh, African regional economic integration, because I think now the continent is even more aware of the need to have much more resilience at the continental and regional level in terms of trade in the areas of food, uh, but also other services. And so I think that will continue to get a very strong impetus. And who knows, maybe the result will be we'll, we'll start to uh, take advantage of the opportunity posed, posed by the Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement. I think if you take a look at what's, uh, what our lives have become in this period and, and what is still sustaining uh, given this dynamics, I think things tied to telecom, work from home solutions, e-commerce as well, I think is also going to be very, very relevant. Um, and you know, it, it'll be also interesting to see what come what else gets developed coming out of this. But I think my 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 thoughts, and my feelings are very much in line with what uh, Kunle shared. Great. And Sim, Teresa, I'm covered. The only one I would have added would be call centers, but I think all the other sectors that our colleagues have uh, referred to are true. I might just also add 
although I want to be inspirational, but I'm very concerned that the next phase is going to be winner take all in many industries. So it's going to be a situation where there'll be many that will fall by the wayside and the winners are going to be dominant, um, as I see it. Thank yeah. you. That historical perspective proves you right. So thank you. Well, wonderful. We want to stick to time. And so we're going to wrap this up now. I know that the thousands of participants who have joined us today join me in thanking you, Kunle, for your excellent moderation of this panel. Thank you, Rilela. Thank you, Admasu. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'd also like to thank our media partners. We have several media partners who have assisted with this effort, making sure that we got the word out. And um, they will also be publishing this video and the slides on their websites so as to make this information as freely and widely available as possible so that we can support our brothers and sisters on the continent as all of the business community joins arms to try to deal with the challenges that we face. So thank you to Mail and Guardian Ventures, Africa Investor, Capital Ethiopia, iAfrica, African Leadership Magazine, APO Group, and She Leads Africa. Um, next, once again, I want to thank our financial sponsors, our silver sponsors, General Electric Africa, FSDH, and the Trade and Development Bank. And a special thank you to our lead sponsor, Standard Bank, for your tremendous support. You will receive a survey following this, and we hope that you will respond. We re take your feedback quite seriously. We read all of the feedback that we heard last week and have done our best to address um, what we heard. We wanted to have a more interactive session. I hope that those of you who have joined us both weeks will say that we got a lot of Q&A in today, and I'm pleased that we listened to, to that feedback, and I hope that you are as well. Please join us next week for what is going to be a very important and timely session. The uh, next week's session is about the informal sector. It's called This Is Not the West, How Africa's Informal Sector Responds to COVID-19. We will have another very able moderator next week. We will have Hakim Bella Osagi, who serves as the chairman of SS FSDH Holding Company and is also a Harvard Business School Senior Lecturer of Business Administration. He has assembled a fantastic panel to address this topic. We have Nasir El Rafai, who's the governor of Kaduna State in Nigeria, who himself is currently positive for COVID-19, so understands this topic on both a professional and personal level. We have Ahmed Mushi Brock, who's a professor of economics at Yale University. And we have Amanlo Oku Ambaka, who's with McKinsey previously as a development economist. So we really thank you very much for um, putting together this uh, panel. All of our moderators have been deeply involved in helping us to shape the content and to recruit speakers. And so we think that this one in particular next week is important. As mentioned earlier in this call, we've been hearing reports um, of how um, people are getting restless in the streets. And so, and understandably, people who hustle to make their living on a day-to-day -day basis don't have enough food and what happens? So Hakeem will label ably lead us through that discussion next week and then we will be followed the week after that with the fourth in this series and that session will be on strategy how to develop strategy in uncertain times and we'll be led in that session by professor andy zalecki we are also developing a panel specifically on the topic of women and how covid19 is affecting women in africa and we will be getting that scheduled and bringing it online. We have some great speakers coming into that one as well. Please keep checking the website, but we will also be sending out email notifications as we schedule that fifth seminar. So with that, I'd like to conclude today. Thank you very much and stay safe. Bye-bye.